we can get you a much more stronger story than that with Jill Castillo, the CEO of Citizens Bank of Edmund, who joins us around the table now. Good morning, Jill. Good morning. You've got a powerful story to tell. It is not that gloomy. Talk us through it. It's not. I think relationship bankers that have intimate knowledge of their, their borrowers and that have been disciplined through this, this last five, 10 years are not going to see the type of weakness in the commercial real estate market that, that others are anticipating. I think those that have more distance from their borrowers or, or outside the banking system, I think that's where it has a vulnerability. Lots of regional impacts as well. So large urban centers with large multi-tenant buildings have more susceptibility to some of these um, this weakness and higher interest rates and and potential vacancy issues than maybe smaller smaller type of commercial real estate that may be office occupied still, but that the lender knew this borrower and was able to structure appropriately low LTVs, focusing on debt service coverage for the last few years. Those types of lenders are going to come out okay. There was some real stress about 9, 10, 11 months ago in the spring of last year for the smaller banks. I think for a lot of people, they concluded that the bigger banks will get bigger and the smaller banks need to grow and consolidate. Do you have a different view on that? The reason we need more than 4,000 banks in America, why do we need that number? Well, when we talk about smaller banks, even at the beginning of last year, small banks, truly ones like mine, were fine. We really didn't see the deposit runoff because there's a diversity of deposits. The average deposit amounts are very low. And so you, didn't ha you weren't counting on hundreds of millions in of dollars concentrate on very few depositors. Um, and also you had more, like we have, two-thirds of our deposits are non-interest bearing, non-maturing deposits. And so when you have that, there's not, even though you had some loss and some now competitive pressures on the interest bearing deposits, you just didn't have those same um, pressures as like some of the large regional institutions. And um, broker deposits also also increased quite a bit due to the demand earlier last year. And we've seen that soften quite a bit. Um, so again, it goes back to relationships. And I I think whenever we look at having 4,000 plus banks in the United States, it's a great strength for us, um, both in having a bank in your location. If you're in rural um, areas, you may not have access to a bank if you have consolidation. I'm in a suburban area with over 50, 60 banks in a, in a 100,000 person town, but there's relevancy for a small bank because we're the ones you know, sponsoring the, the football stadium and the little league games, and, and we put on a big street festival to revitalize our downtown. There's social capital there that you don't find in larger institutions, and, and you see it even represented in TV or movies, um, just how important a, a bank can be. Um, consolidation yields distance, which I think also yields risk, and um, we're seeing that as we just talked about commercial real estate and deposit potential loss. Whenever you have a tie to your bank and, and your banker, um, it, it lessens the risk overall, even though maybe small institutions systemically it makes a difference. Let's talk about some of those relationships, especially at a time where a lot of Fed officials are talking about anecdotes and how important they are to really understanding the economy. How much is the economy slowing? Do you get the sense that your clients, the relationships that you have, are expressing a, a greater degree of concern than some of the macro data might suggest? I really don't see that in our locality. I think regionally you do hear that. Um, it does have an impact on small business as we have rates increasing for them, especially those that have variable rates where they're not having a big repricing or refinancing that this is this is hitting them at with each rate increase. And so they're starting to have that pressure as commercial real estate has the higher needs to be able to service their debt, we've seen rents go up quite a bit. So some of the small businesses, it's really been more of a struggle. And then for consumers as well, the higher cost of putting food on the table and, and operating a household have been really challenging. You talked about the strength of uh, being a smaller bank and all of these relationships and the ability to diversify in the way that you want. How vulnerable do you feel to some of the new capital rules that could come down the pike that we keep hearing about in Congress? Yeah, the new capital rules don't directly impact me because they're targeted for larger institutions, but there will be some type of trickle down. What I'm most concerned about those new rules is where we have greater specificity of whenever it's um, that this is going to cost you more capital versus it being generally you need to have more capital is you have unintended consequences. So then you have potentially some, some transactions that would occur within the bank banking system get moved out of the banking system and actually could have more harmful impacts to the economy and less ability for regulators to have an impact. Do you think the proposal meets the moment then? Based on what we saw last year, what was that in your mind? Was that a failure of regulation or oversight? 
You know, I just as we need a whole bank's accountable, I think regulators are also accountable too. We have really great regulations and we have really great decentralized regulatory structure in the United States, which is a great strength. And I think where we've seen some uh, failures or some vulnerabilities and whenever that hasn't been executed well. Um, so that's what I would, would say is that we really, um, we have great regional examiners that are on the ground that understands the local economy, what type of risk banks are taking. And it's just important that they continue to do that. And I, I think changing the structure kind of can penalize and, and take that autonomy out and you then aren't able to assess risk as uh, sophisticated in such a sophisticated manner as you can do before. What kind of proposal would you like to see? Some kind of deposit insurance reform? What would you like to see? I think the deposit insurance is also, uh, there's so many different tools with marketplaces to be able to exchange deposit insurance, ability to pledge collateral to deposits, that there's really, to me, no, there's no need to really change anything there. We have less than, right, we're right at 5% uninsured deposits in our organization. Organization. And when we saw organizations last year be over 90% uninsured deposits, that, there was no reason for that. There was plenty of tools to be able to use. And you now see banks really shifting and making sure that they don't have that exposure on an uninsured deposit or uncollateralized deposits. Bramo, we've been talking about this, whether the regulation, the proposal at least, meets the moment of 9, 10, 11 months ago. And the message I keep receiving every single time is probably not. Not only that, but a lot of people are saying that probably down in Washington, they're going to start to agree with this. Morgan Stanley actually started to turn bullish on U.S. banks. Betsy Grasick. Betsy Grasick, because she didn't think that the capital rules would be as harsh as some people were expecting. So that pushback is pretty widespread, and maybe some people are already pricing in that it's not going to really get applied as, as initially proposed. We'll keep this conversation going. Jill, let's talk about real estate if we can just a little bit. You mentioned it earlier. Do you have a different view on commercial real estate? And is your view on commercial real estate different to your overall view on CRE across the nation. And what I mean by that is your bank exposure might be one thing, but do you think that speaks to the broader story at the moment? Yeah, I recently saw a survey of banks that were confident with their own commercial real estate holdings, but not necessarily really confident broadly. And I think it has to do with just that there aren't as many banks in commercial real estate. I mean, as far as like looking at the whole portfolio, only 50% or so is, is financed by banks. Um, you know, I, I feel really comfortable with our uh, portfolio. We have always been a, a real estate concentration concentration bank, and um, and have great risk management tools. I mean, as a, as a banker, you have to be an expert risk manager, and so it requires discipline going into higher risk type of lending. And so, making sure you really understand is this debt service coverage ratio real, and does this value is this appraisal we got reasonable? Um, what is the value looking like over time? Does it make you nervous that everybody else thinks their bank book is okay and everybody else's is, is the problem? Yeah, well, I, it would on the surface, but when you look at the composition of how real estate's been financed, there's been lots of deals we passed on that non-banks have financed. And so I think there is a lot of that market mix occurring. Banks have great tools, so we can also you know, re-amortize. We have flexibility when it comes to restructuring rates. Whenever We've all been through workouts before, so as long as you're, you go in with your eyes wide open, that you're working with borrowers that know you know have great integrity, you should be okay. Jill, I was surprised by this. I think you were too. What does auto lending look like for you in the bank? Yeah, we've seen less demand for, for car loans. And so the rates are driving consumers not to purchase um, on the, whenever I look out on the ground. But there is some demand up there from like, I didn't kind of buy a car a few months ago or a few years ago, and so now it's time to buy one. Uh, but I, I think we, we will see some great demand. There's, there is demand kind of pent up because the rates have been high. We've seen consumer debt go up as well and, and it being more difficult to, to have the savings that we saw uh, during COVID and, and even pre-COVID. So this is surprising data for me. What greases the wheels for you? Can you give us an idea of the number? We talk about moves of 50 basis points, 100 basis points, one full percentage point on Fed funds coming down, and that's going to get things going again. Does that move the dial for you when you drop rates that much? Do people start lining up to borrow money to buy cars? Well, not necessarily by cars, because I think we're still seeing a lot of auto financing incentives from the dealers and from the manufacturers. So, um, you know, I don't really see that as much because I think their other debt is what's causing some stress. So it's not necessarily going out and getting necessarily the new car loan. Definitely on the used car loan, you would have um, a higher debt, higher um, higher rate associated with that. But the other demands upon and the perception of what the rate would be, I think it's keeping folks from purchasing. Can you give us an idea of rates to borrow right now? What does it look like? 
it like if we come to the bank to you today? What am I paying? I'm not paying 550, which is Fed funds. What am I paying? Yeah, you're right at the prime rate, and so you're maybe a little bit less than that. So, uh, but you can still go to dealer finance and get quite a bit lower. Um, and, and so they're really kind of, been, and I don't know what GM is doing, but they may have some incentives and be you know interesting to look at that. Jill, it's good to see you. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Great to be here. And send our love to Esther George, favorite Fed official, formerly the Kansas City Fed. Just the absolute best. The best. Loved her. The absolute best. Jill, thank you.